Hi everybody, my name is James Hunt, I'm the Upstart maintainer, and with me we've got Dmitry Lekov. Sorry? Um, I have to apologise, I've got a bit of a cold at the moment, so I might need to hand over to yeah. Dmitry as and when. Um, so this talk today is really just a very brief overview of what we're planning uh, in the coming months with Upstart. Uh, we've got the overview there. We can just go to the first slide, the first proper slide. Um, the usual caveats, uh, these are... <laughs> Other way. Yeah, fine. <laughs> okay, um, so the usual caveats, what pre we're presenting today is just some thoughts about uh, uh, features that we, we're looking to introduce, but we are actually very interested to get feedback from you guys and anybody else who's, who's listening and uh, reading online. Um, don't hold us to necessarily to what, what, what we're talking about today, but some of these things will, will be an upstart in the next few months, we hope. Um, you may or may not know, but Upstart um, uses Ptrace to track um, processes, and it also uses Ptrace to identify when a service is actually ready. <clears throat> the concept is, yeah, service readiness. And that design, it's very simple, it's very cross-platform. Most platforms, apart from Herd, I believe, provide Ptrace. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a well, it's a POSIX interface. Um, it works very well for PID tracking and, and service readiness, but there are a small number of demons which behave in odd ways. And we're looking this next Ubuntu cycle, I guess, um, to refine the current design to track to catch some of these um, outliers which don't uh, don't operate as expected. Um, if you have knowledge of Upstart, you've written jobs before, you'll know we can you know you, you can uh, you can use things like the the pre-start and the post post-start uh, sections to uh, uh, refine. Um, it's concept of when services like cups, for example, think they should be ready. But we're looking, yeah, this cycle to, to tweak, to, to enhance the, the P-trace abilities of Upstart. Um, C-group support. Um, we're looking, it's been mentioned a number of times, we are looking to add a C-group stanza, specifically for resource management, nothing else. Um, it would be a no-op on any other platform uh, that, that Upstart was running on. And, um, sorry, can we... <laughs> I need some water, actually. Um, rather whipping through these things, but this is an interesting uh, slide, I think. Um, states. Uh, Scott, James Remnant, who, of course, wrote Upstart, uh, talked about this um, a few years back. There are some interesting scenarios with Upstart, because Upstart's emitting events. <clears throat> Any jobs that care about those events um, will react accordingly when events are, are produced. Um, so the jobs kind of consume the events, but, but when those have all... When uh, the a job sort of starts, the event conditions become true and that job started. When Upstart determines that that event is essentially, the life cycle of the event is over, it, it's discarded. And that, that works. But there are scenarios, there's one particular scenario where that, that, that does have problems. Um, if you were to, so the example here we got, um, the job up here, start and started, bar and stop, but baz. So saying, start this foo job when the bar and the baz jobs have started, but also stop it um, just before the bar job stops and just before the baz job stops. That all works perfectly. Of course, what we're doing here is we're running this daemon called my daemon. That all works perfectly, except in the scenario where either bar or baz stops and then restarts. Um, the problem being that, uh, where are we? <laughs> the, uh, so my daemon will start, but when, when bar, for example, stops, we're going to stop my daemon. The problem, though, is that if bar restarts, my daemon never restarts. So what, we would, what we're looking to do is introducing, and this is not, this is a kind of pseudo code, this is not how, this is not the syntax we'd actually end up with, but essentially something like while bar and bars are running, run my daemon. So if one of them stops, stop my daemon. If bar restarts, restart my daemon. Okay? It's a fairly, fairly subtle, it's a fairly unusual scenario that you'd want to care about these kind of conditions, but there are a few. Um, so we're looking at that as well, states. Um, a time bridge. <clears throat> We've introduced a lot of bridges recently. For those of you who don't know, a bridge is essentially um, a way to inject events from some other source into the upstart system. So we've got, a, we've got bridges for UDEV, 
So if you, you hot plug a device, you can have a job that starts or stops, reacts to those events. We've got, uh, what else we got? We've got decomp for bridges, we've got, um, we've got file bridges to, to, so if a file is created or deleted and modified, again, have an upside job react to that. We're looking at a time bridge, which would give you cron-like features. But it's really nice, we've got code to do this in, in a sort of basic form. You can have jobs that start after some, some point after the system has booted, or some point after a job has finished running, for example. You know, sometime after a file system has been mounted um, regularly, you know, run, it, run it periodically every two days after some other condition. So you can, you can imagine some fairly com complex and, but, but very useful um, scenarios for, for a time bridge, which would really sort of enrich the lives of setting admins and, and so on. Oops, sorry. Um, platform support. I mean, we, <laughs> Upstart was written for Linux, but and we do make use of Linux specific pieces here and there, but it's not necessarily tied to Linux. We do use slash prop for certain things, out of memory support and Cheroot support. Um, but if you know, if someone would care to, to be interested in, in helping out, um, it, it wouldn't be you know it would be feasible to port it to BSD. Herd, not so sure about Herd. I don't know a lot about that. Um, but for, for the BSDs, I mean that the. the um, the main issue, I guess, is iNotify. We do make heavy use of iNotify in Upstart via the dependent NIH library. That would be an issue. Um, BSD, I don't know if there's any BSD hackers around, but BSD has, has a concept of K-Events, which is a really powerful framework, which can give you iNotify type abilities, much richer than iNotify, really. But, um, and in fact, there's, there's a project um, that someone found, Luke K-Event iNotify, which gives you an iNotify, the simulated iNotify layer, essentially, for BSD. Um, so if you're interested in that, then let us know. Um, network events. Um, I guess we'll, we'll bring this up in the second talk today, at four o'clock, I think. We have seen a number of scenarios where it'd be very useful to have an upside job react to a network event, like when a, a client comes in and listens. Sorry, uh, where, where a database is listening and a client connects. Um, it would solve a whole class of problems, I think, and you can't currently do that. I, I don't know if we've got any kernel developers in the room, but if there is already um, some sort of network notification layer that we're not aware of, please do make us aware of it. Um, I've seen some patches to LKML, and they were rejected, I believe, but that would be a really useful facility. Um, oh, yeah, a couple of interesting ones, I guess. I mean, this, is, this, is, this would be, I guess, Ubuntu-specific, but it would work in any distribution using Upstart. Um, you could have a simple init CTL script. <coughs> In CTL being the main com com sort of, uh, control command for upstart, you can have a little script which, which emitted an event when a, you know, uh, a network manager changed to a different uh, ESSID network. So that'd be kind of nice from the user's, user level, um, session level upstart. So you could run a job when you, you, know, um, you switched to a private network or your home network, we could shut down services when you, when you went to a public network, for example. And you could even do something crazy like this, again, with initctl. Um, you, know, you can put in a little shell script hook, which calls initctl again to emit an event. It actually works crazily, but you could, you, you, could, you could run a job just before you suspend. I mean, it's obviously a bit of a dangerous thing to do. Um, you might end up with a system that never actually suspends if your job misbehaves, but you can do crazy things like that. The point being, though, you can use initctl <clears throat> as, a, as a first class citizen to, to inject events into the upstart sort of uh, namespace of, of events. Um, it's not a second-class citizen. You could write a, a shell script, which is a fully-fledged bridge if you want to, using that command. Um, Dimitri, can I pass it to you because I'm struggling on the, the throat, throat front here. Right. We, well, this is a bit hypothetical. We currently do have an upstart support to start daemons and services <laughs> like truths. <laughs> and you can manage your services inside a truth with a system level running upstart such that when your machine responds, the truth is recreated and then you can start your services there as well. At the moment, there are other uh, namespaces available in the Linux kernels for networking, user space, usernames and PIDs and etc. At the moment, it is preferred to simply start an LXC container 
inside which you have upstart as PID1 and it manages all the jobs there. But it would be interesting to explore if it would be useful for the system level upstart to actually run and manage jobs inside the containers for you, such that you have slightly more flexibility and you can control them from outside the LXC container without entering into it and you can restart services and see what they're doing. It's an option. I'm, I'm not quite sure whether we should be implementing it or not, but it would be interesting to explore. Yeah, so again, going back to the comment earlier on, I mean, if, you know, if you guys have got particular scenarios you'd like to see upstart support, please let us know. Yeah. So why are we here? Um, right, so adding new features to upstart, it is a relatively slow process for us, but that's a good thing, mm -hmm. I'd like to think. <laughs> um, we... We do all our, our development on a, on a mailing list. We've got IRC channels and so on. We use Launchpad bugs as well. But <clears throat> for, a, for a feature to go into Upstart, it's got to pass through a number of gates, essentially. You've got to have a clean design. It's got to be documented. It's got to be you know, a generally useful facility. Um, we have to have unit tests for all of the, all the features. We're now introducing sort of scenario tests as well, which you're going to have to pass on all the different sort of platforms that we support, all the different sort of har hardware platforms, that is. It's got to be fully documented. Um, where are we? Yeah, it mustn't negative, negatively impact the performance of, of previous releases. We mustn't break the, uh, the interfaces that we have in place either. We, you know, we, we basically guarantee we're not going to kind of knock out half our user base if we change the syntax of some, you know, some of the standards uh, in, the, in the jobs. Um, but, but having said all that, you know, we are working on new features all the time. Um, we keep the Upstart cookbook updated um, with every new release that comes out. So if you haven't seen that, there's a link at the end. It's an extremely long document now. I, uh, I think the PDF version's coming up to 200 pages long. And that's it's sort of an addendum, essentially, to the, the man pages. The man pages are still the place to go, the knowledge on upstart. But the, um, the cookbook has lots of examples. It tries to explain why the design is like it is. Can we get to the next? You've got the <laughs> oh, and there we go. So yeah, that, that's how to, how to find us, um, IRC, mailing lists. And is there a final slide on? Yeah, OK, so off the home page, the cookbook, um, the code itself, and the all important man, man 5 in it. That, that is the de facto uh, place to go if you have questions on Upstart. And that's it. Thanks very much. Any questions? Do you have questions or desired features in Upstart that you'd like to see or anything? Open mic. Great. <laughs> oh. Well, we don't, well, we don't specifically, well, okay, so I'm, I'm the, the upstream for Upstart. I'm also the, uh, the maintainer for the Ubuntu version. In, uh, right. But uh, they are essentially the same, with, with two minor changes. Um, so, well, do you want to know? Well, um, <laughs> I mean, for... I'll, I'll be happy to field this question if you like. Yeah, fine. It is on? Okay. So um, the question is, why do you care about other kernels? And well, there's, there's two answers to that. First of all, one thing is that Upstart is naturally very um, conservative in terms of the kernel features that it will depend on to ensure that um, Upstart will uh, provide a, a smooth upgrade path on an older kernel. This is useful for um, both providing in-place upgrades um, between one OS release and the, and the next, um, which is something that uh, uh, Ubuntu cares about a good deal, as well as ensuring that in, the, in various situations, for instance, in, in the cloud where you don't always have control over the running kernel, um, because it may be a, a kernel that's provided by your, your hosting provider, that we remain compatible with that. The other reason, if we're talking about other kernels besides Linux, as opposed to just conservatism in Linux features that we use, um, this becomes relevant specifically because of Debian, which is a, a cross-kernel operating system. Um, and so in order to, to address the fact that Debian is still stuck on Sys5 in it as its default in its system, um, we're trying to provide a solution that works for all of the various Debian sub-projects that, that would care about you know, having the OS no longer work with their kernel. Does that answer your question? <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Oh. Doesn't mean I, I agree with the reason, but okay. 
well, the, yeah, the, the point is that Upstart does use a small set of Linux-specific um, features. Um, but essentially, you know, if you were to get it to run on you know, compiler BSD system, um, there the may be alternatives. There's, no re there's, there's very little code, really, apart from my notify, that is Linux specific. I mean, there are people in, who are interested, for example, in FreeBSD jails, and at the moment you can run Debian inside a FreeBSD jail, and then you get a lot of BSD features that you don't get on a Linux kernel, yet you still get the Linux user space. And for those people who care about those use cases, it's interesting for them, and for us it's easy to support them. So it's, you know, there are benefits to go outside of the Linux kernel. I wish, you know, Linux kernel would get K events, and I wish Linux kernel would get so many other features, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. So. Any other questions? If you've got some more, we say so we'll be around at 4 o'clock. At 4 at four o'clock, we'll have a talk in Strand Room 10B about Upstart and more an overall overview of what Upstart is and where it's heading. So this is more kind of detailed development plan, and that talk is more about what we have already did. Uh, that's at LinuxCon. Yes, that's a good point. It's at LinuxCon. Uh, a battle-hardened Upstart, I believe. OK, thanks.